Uh, hello, this is Fred Bird uh, from Part Super Center, Program Manager for our Motors Program. I'd like to welcome out everyone to the webinar. We're going to wait about a minute for more attendees to join. Um, so let's. Uh, we we have Walt Constani on the line, and I'll do a brief introduction of Walt, uh, and then we'll get started at about 11:01. Uh, All right. Thanks for joining. We expect to have uh, 60 to 70 people on the line today, so uh, we appreciate uh, everybody's attendance. Um, and we try to keep these webinars focused on industry specific topics um, that are helpful for the, uh, the maintenance and repair operations um, on products and technologies that um, cover a range of, of not just applications, but also manufacturers products. Um, and we, we try to keep it as general as possible. So we're not um, pigeonholing, pigeonholing it into a, uh, a GE specific product, but just an industry standard that's out there that can be helpful for the repair and maintenance operations. Okay, so we'll get started. Uh, again, my name is Fred Berg. I work for Parts Super Center. Um, I run our, our motors and motor parts program and primarily focus run our GE, uh, legacy GE product lines. Um, for 28 years, I worked for the GE Motors business and Walt Constani, uh, we worked together. I was a sales leader and Walt was a product service leader. Um, so what was our field service leader that would go out on any DC motor issues that either service shops, ESA shops, or end users had uh, specific niche uh, issues on. Um, and over the years, I can think of, you know, technology changes with, uh, let's say, uh, IGBT inverters and um, shaft voltage issues. Um, using silicon to seal motors and how that kind of interacted with carbon brushes. There's been things over the years that uh, have affected DC motors specifically. Um, so we'd like to give you some background on those. Uh, also, um, you know, DC motors themselves, uh, it's, a, it's a, a technology from days gone by, let's say, but there's a large installed base and there's still some niche applications that are very good for uh, the DC is a, uh, the best choice. So we can see, we see that market continuing. Uh, GE Wulong still builds the product. So there's a real need out there for people to know how to maintain it and know when specifying a DC machine may be right for a certain application. So uh, that being said, I'd like to introduce Walt Constani, who's going to lead this webinar. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, I hope you all can hear me well. Uh, we have uh, quite a, a presentation here today. This is about a week-long school that we used to do uh, for customers and for service shops and for uh, service engineers. I condensed it down a little bit, but uh, I, they told me all oh, you guys are smart. So we're going to go through this in about 35 to 45 minutes. But the goal really is to get everybody uh, acquainted with some of the terms on DC motors and where to look for information. And there'll be a lot of information in this slide deck that uh, Fred is going to post. They are recording this uh, webinar and we'll have a Q&A session uh, at the end of uh, end of the pre presentation. So write down any notes and uh, we'll surely uh, answer them as we go along. Okay, what's a DC motors purpose? I'm not going to read through all of these, but basically it's to make, to make uh, mechanical energy and torque. A DC motor produces torque. So there's basically a couple of types of uh, uh, applications. There's zero to base speed, which are constant torque, and that's where the load doesn't change with speed. So that's like a conveyor, a crane, an elevator. And then there's constant horsepower applications, and those are coilers and winders, where the motor typically has a wide speed range and the load does vary with speed. So let's go through uh, where they're found. Well, they're found pretty much everywhere. Uh, even in today where we're changing over to AC technology because it's so much improved with the drives and the motors, uh, DC motors are still used in a variety of applications all around the world. 
from mining to paper mills to steel mills to cement plants to many ski lifts still, uh, electric vehicles, um, elevators, test stands, and all kinds of uh, applications. Let's go through some of the product lines just to familiarize you with them. Uh, we make NEMA sized motors in the 180 to 5010 frame up to about 400 horsepower. You can see the typical model number is listed there. Uh, five uh, is a GE designation for rotating. CD is always meant commercial duty. And then the 203 is basically a frame uh, a designation. And then the rest of it are mechanical and electrical codes. And over on the right side, you'll see the, uh, the applicable instruction manual, buyer's guide and application guide. So if you get into an instance where you need to uh, look up a motor, you have the documents that uh, listed for that particular one. We produce uh, MD motors, which are armored motors. They started out being used for steel mills and then graduated uh, by putting large blowers on them into the excavator industry. So they're basically the same motors. Uh, the 230 volt ones were for steel and then the 460 volt or higher are rated for uh, excavators. Uh, they're a very rugged motor. They have tapered shafts. Uh, so that, that uh, couplings can be put on and off easily and they can be switched in and out. They uh, can typically be turned end for end and they'll fit in the same place. And you can see a typical model number and uh, uh, codes there. The excavator motors, again, are a larger version of the steel mill motors. Uh, they have bigger ratings. They're big blower ventilated. They're, they come in both horizontal or vertical. Verticals are used for like to swing on a, on a shovel or a drag line. Uh, we have X motor designs, which provide extra torque. And again, the instruction manual is listed there and, the, uh, and there's an internal buyers and application guide for those. And they're typically sold through OEMs. Excavator generators. Now these power the large shovels and drag lines. Uh, they can be up to 100 tons and 40 feet long as shown in that one on the lower one. The, uh, the upper one is more for a, a shovel, and it's a smaller motor generator set that powers. So a synchronous motor or an induction motor drives the motor, the generators on each side of it, and then those generators will power the motor on a drag line or a shovel. And then there'll be an umbilical cord that runs out to a power substation to provide power to come into the switch gear to operate those AC motors. And that allows us to, uh, to lift the bucket, uh, like on a drag line, and the generator is powering the motor that's lifting the bucket. But when you want to lower the bucket, the motor that's uh, lifting it up now becomes a generator and puts power back into the generator, which tries to basically speed up the synchronous motor that's driving the motor generator set. And it actually re regenerates power back into the line. So these are kind of a unique, uh, unique animal. Our normal CD6000 industrial line are the larger uh, of motors, probably 400 to up to about 4,000 horsepower. They're either four pole or six pole. Uh, they can have different features, ball or roller bearings. There's accessory mounting surfaces for tachometers and uh, brakes and other kinds of things. On the small end, uh, I think we still produce a K3 motor line, which is one to three horsepower. They're made for small machine tools, uh, knitting factories, things where they just use a lot of a lot of small motors. They're kind of a basic uh, cheap and dirty motor, but uh, they're designed to be a very simple and very standardized. We also produce gearless elevator motors. So uh, this particular motor will sit on top of the uh, uh, the elevator and the, the ropes from the car go around that big shiv there and there's an integral brake that's part of the motor and that eliminates uh, the older days of having a motor drive a gearbox with a shiv on it. And these are very low speed motors and very high torque. We also produce battery truck lines that are used in underground mining uh, in different specialized vehicles. They're totally enclosed. A lot of them are rated for uh, MSHA. Uh, they're OEM specific. Uh, as noted, there's Brookville Mining and IMCO are a couple of the, uh, the OEMs that we sell these to. There's a BY line, which a lot of used our emergency lube oil pump for turbines. So they pump oil to the uh, turbine bearings in the event of a power failure and they have to coast down, which takes uh, a long time. So they need to keep oil going into the bearings so they don't lose those. So these are usually uh, powered by batteries 
and switch on automatically in the event of a power failure to run the oil pump to keep uh, oil flowing to those, uh, those bearings. So they go to OEMs like Buffalo Pumps and Solar. So let's go through the hard part here. I'm gonna to try to make you all DC motor experts in, uh, in a few minutes. So you have to learn uh, about five uh, laws that are fundamentals to basically all DC and AC machines. The first one is if there's a conductor and it's carrying current, it produces flux which circulates around itself. And in my little sketch there, it's the right hand rule. It's one of those, you know, those dead guys from a long time ago invented these rules. Uh, so if current's flowing down through that conductor, flux flows around it. On the right side, if we take some steel and we make it into a core that looks like the shape of a C with an air gap on it, and we wrap some turns of wire around one side and we put some volts and amps into it, it will produce flux that flows through that air gap. And you can generate flux uh, by putting more volts, more amps through it, and, uh, and keep going. Uh, the bottom left is if you have a conductor that moves through a flux field, you will generate a voltage on that conductor proportional to how fast you're moving it and how much flux you have. To the right side of that, there's another one that's kind of interesting. If you have a conductor in a flux field and you put current through it, you're exciting it or running current through it, it will produce a force on that, on that conductor to move it through that field. That's another important one we're gonna to need to know. And the bottom one in the middle is current flow. Current always flows from the higher voltage to the lower voltage. Basically, if you think about it, if you put two batteries in parallel and one's got the 12 volts and one's got 10 volts, the one with 12 is gonna put power into the one with 10 volts. So those are the basic fundamentals that we need to know. When you start out with a DC motor, basically it consists of uh, a simple two pole motor, has uh, steel uh, poles with wire wrapped around them, multiple turns, could be 500 turns, could be a thousand turns. And we bring those out and we connect them opposite polarity so that you have one that basically becomes a north pole and one becomes a south pole. And they're in a steel frame and in the center you have the armature. Flux will be produced by exciting those coils and it completes its magnetic path around the frame as shown in the, the little picture here. And that flux flows through that armature. And you can generate flux by varying the current. The turns are fixed. So flux is generated by amps times turns. And you'll hear that term a lot if you uh, hang around any kind of motor people. And you can do that all day long, except there becomes a couple problems. Any winding in a motor, the current going through it squared times its resistance is heat. So you don't want a lot of heat. And the other problem is you start to get too much flux in that steel, so that becomes a problem. So there's a thing called a saturation curve, and you can run flux in and out. I'm hoping you can see my mouse. You can run flux in and out here on this straight line all day long and be in good shape. Well, as soon as you start to get into saturation where the steel can only handle so much flux, that curve starts to bend over and you end up putting a lot more current in to get a little change in flux. So that's not very efficient, plus it creates a lot more heat. So a motor designer will generate, will generally uh, design a motor so that it's operated in this linear region of amps times turns. So that's how we maximize the efficiency uh, when we design the motor with the fields. Okay, so we're back to our simple two pole motor. Now a DC motor, the speed is not dependent on the number of poles. It's not like an AC motor. Uh, you have to think of it more like a car. You know, if you have a two cylinder car, four cylinder car, or a six cylinder engine, you're gonna get more power because you have more cylinders. And basically that's what we're doing with a DC motor. The more poles allows you to get more flux into the armature to affect the conductors that are in the armature that's gonna produce the force. So here's what happens next, and we take a couple more of those rules. We have our F1 and F2 leads, which is the field, and we put field on there. So we generate flux through the air gap, through the armature, and out the other side, it goes around the frame, and it generates flux on those conductors. Now there's conductors in the armature that run lengthwise and come out to a commutator on the end, which is that copper cylinder with all the uh, insulated segments, and there are brushes that sit on the commutator 
that allow you to bring current and volts and amps in from the outside world from the drive. So at standstill, you have flux flowing through the air gap because the field is on, but the armature isn't rotating. So as soon as current goes in A1 and A2 from the drive, when you say, okay, let's run this motor, it basically is a short down through the armature and back out the other side until those conductors start moving. So you're putting current through, it ends up being a high current because it's basically a short. So that current generates a force on that conductor because it's in that flux field. And because the current goes down and then comes out the bottom, it puts the right polarity on there and it puts forces on all those conductors in that flux field. And because that armature is held between bearings, it's gonna to start to rotate. The force on those conductors is equal to this little equation over here on the left which is equal to B, which is flux density, times the length of the armature, times the amount of current. So you can generate more force by going to a longer armature or longer motor. Now, the torque that the DC motor actually produces is equal to the force on all those conductors times the radius of the armature. And I hope that all makes sense. Torque, torque is always force times radius. So a larger armature you're gonna get more torque than you will on a smaller armature. The problem is on a larger armature, you can't run very fast because you have to hold all those windings into the, the core of the armature uh, versus a smaller one where you can allow a higher speed. So I'm hoping all that makes sense. So a couple of things are going on here. You're putting in current from standstill, you're generating a force on those conductors in the flux field and it's gonna cause them to move. They wanna get out of that flux field. As they move, it also generates a voltage on those conductors from one of our early laws there that puts a voltage there that comes out basically to where the brushes are. And that thing we talked about, the higher voltage and the lower voltage comes into play. The armature has a lower voltage until those conductors start spinning fast enough to almost equal the dry voltage that's going in. So if all that makes sense, you now understand how a DC motor works. So the armature that's induced inside the, arm, inside the armature itself is called a counter EMF. And that's basically equal to the flux density, how much flux you have from the main field, times the length of the armature, times the velocity, how fast they're moving. Look at the terms a little different. It's a flux density term again, times length, times velocity. So the counter EMF, is proportional to the current in the field times the RPM. So if you rearrange those terms for RPM or speed, you'll see the speed of a DC motor is proportional to the armature volts divided by the field current. Now those aren't absolute numbers, they're, they're a ratio. So if you want to get a motor to run, you have to put field on it. So basically it's kind of a fixed field and you raise the armature volts, the RPM goes up until you get to rate it. If you want the motor to go faster, you reduce the field current. Now the problem becomes, if you reduce the field current to zero, what happens to the speed? It basically will go to infinity. And that's what happens if you've ever heard somebody say, oh, we lost the field and a motor oversped. That's because the field was so weak that there was enough armature volts and current there for that armature to just speed up probably until it destructed itself. So again, the force on the conductors times the radius is the torque. And the torque is a bunch of machine design constants times the flux times the armature amps, or what we refer to as D squared L, the diameter, uh, diameter squared times the length. Um, if you look at some real big steel mill motors, or if you've ever been on the Disney cruise ships, uh, they have GE motors that power those, or AC motors out of Peterborough, but they're very big in diameter, about 16 feet but they're only about three feet long. While they're getting all that torque and their direct drive to the propellers, there's no transmission, there's no gearboxes or anything, and they're using all of that to get the torque by going to a large diameter, uh, but they don't go very fast. And of course, a propeller on a cruise ship isn't gonna go very fast times its length. So they're pretty short, uh, short uh, motors. So that's how we get the, uh, the torque out of uh, DC motors by playing with the diameter, the speed that's required, and how long. So you'll see some uh, machine tool motors, 
that look like slabs of bologna. They're real long and they're not very big in diameter. Well, we're trying to get the torque, but because they have to run very fast and change speed very fast, so you can't have a large diameter with all that inertia changing speed fast. But if you have a small diameter, you can do that. So you get, you get the torque by going to the length. Just a little more on uh, how a motor will, will motor or generate. Uh, I'm gonna look over to the second equation here. Well, we'll start with the first one. At a, at a 500 volt motor running at 500 volts, about 480 volts is being generated inside the armature by those conductors moving through the field. There's about an 18 volt, what we call an IR drop. That's the current going through the armature at no load and the resistance of the armature. And there's a two volt, what we call brush drop because brushes are carbon, they have a little bit of resistance. So basically that's what's happening when a motor's running at no load. Well, when you start out that motor and you put hundred volts on it, it's not rotating. So you have zero counter EMF, nothing's moving. So you draw a lot of current. So that 98 volts there ends up being the current that's required through that low resistance field or, or armature to get the motor up to speed. Um, likewise, if you're going at 500 volts on the bottom equation and you reduce it down to 100, you wanna slow that motor way down. You crank it down to 100. Well, that armature is still running basically at rated speed. So you have to have a minus voltage to equal this equation. So you end up with a minus 382 of IR, which means the motor will regenerate uh, when you try to slow it down fast and it'll do that. So drives have to have a regenerative capability if they're in an application that requires it so that they can absorb that volts and amps coming from the motor as you overspeed it. And that's not unlike uh, any AC motor. If you drive an AC motor that's rated 1800 RPM, you try to run it at 1900 RPM, it's going to regenerate uh, volts because you're running it faster than uh, the design speed and for the conductors and everything in it. I won't go through this in detail because this is about a, a three hour lecture, but if you cut open a motor and you laid it out flat, you'd have a couple of main coils and this is like a four pole motor, but I just showed uh, the one here in the center and it's a North pole and there's a South pole and then a North and a South. And then there's brushes down here on the bottom. Well, current is flowing in and we'll assume that current flows in a positive brush. So if it's 100 amps, basically all those armature conductors are in series. So 50 amps is trying to go to the left and 50 amps is going to the right to go meet the next minus brush and to, to flow out back to the drive. Well, these are the commutator segments, these little lines, and the armature coils are kind of shown here as you get outside. But if that armature is moving through here, you'll note that on the right side, 50 amps is going through all those conductors toward the right to get to the other brush. The coil that's underneath this brush right here in the center is being shorted out by the brush. So the current in that coil has to be zero. As soon as that armature conductor moves away from that brush to the left, that current has to reverse. So the brushes in a DC motor reverse the current in the armature conductors and then they have to do that to keep the polarities correct so that we have the right force on all those conductors so there's current flowing in all those windings all the time except for the poor guy here that's being uh, shorted out so what happens when you take a car battery and you connect the positive to negative well it sparks well you don't want sparking and there's about 15 to 20 volts in each one of these armature conductors um, when it gets underneath that brush. So to get the sparking down to a point where you don't see it is you have to basically negate the voltage that's in that coil. So if it's at 15 volts, you have to inject the minus 15 volts into that. So the way we do that is by having other coils in here that are called commutating coils that are very narrow. They fit between the main coils and they induce a minus voltage into that armature coil that is being shorted out by the brush. So that is zero, so that when it gets past the brush, it can reverse and the current flows the other way. The commutating coils are heavy copper. They're in series with the armature. So any current that goes through the armature also goes through these coils and they make flux. 
that creates a minus voltage in those coils. So we're doing a lot with flux uh, to create voltage in parts in the machine. So the trick is to be able to have the commutating coil and we use shims behind them, either steel or non-steel, uh, to affect the nozzle of flux so that we don't see sparking at the brush when we load test the motor uh, after it's built. And you can have identical motors that may have different shimming behind those coils, even though the coils are all identical, oops, um, so that we get the commutation, which is black commutation. You don't want brushes sparking because that causes pitting of the commutator and it causes burnt brushes and a whole other lot of bad stuff. Equalizer coils, if you've ever heard that term, they are little windings that are in the armature that are meant to equalize the voltages at certain parts of the armature that are supposed to be equalized. Uh, in a typical four pole motor, that would be 180 degrees apart. So there'll be a little wire in there that acts kind of like a little shorting bar to equalize those voltages. So that's just, so you hear the term, that's what it's supposed to do. And again, if you see, uh, you know, if the voltage is too high in that coil, it's due to reactance voltage. And I'm not gonna go through the whole explanation, but it's basically the inductance in that armature coil times DIDT, which is how much current in that coil and how fast you're trying to change it. So it's harder to commutate or to get a motor to not spark on a very fast machine, one that runs three, four, 5,000 RPM, like for a, a dynamometer, uh, than it is for a motor that runs uh, 50 RPM uh, on an elevator. But it's all related to the commutating coils and the shimming that we use behind them. You'll also see on larger motors, there's another problem. That flux that encircles conductors with current flowing through them uh, on a large motor, it gets to be pretty high. So that flux starts to create flux that negates the flux that the main pole is trying to produce, and it actually weakens the overall flux. Well, that's not desirable. It makes the motor speed go up. So on large motors, you'll see things that we call pole face windings that are these big copper bars that are insulated that go down through the main poles and what we do there is we run current in those opposite the armature current in the armature so that one flux cancels the other flux. So again, we're playing games here with flux to, uh, to figure out the overall flux we need to get torque out of the machine. So we don't want these armature conductors screwing it up by adding or subtracting their own flux. And again, when you get into a four pole motor and you start adding all these coils, the inner pole coils or the commutating coils, the main coils, it gets to be pretty crowded. Uh, the armature itself is made up of punchings and we do that to get heat transfer out and to reduce what's called eddy current losses. Whenever you have flux going through steel, you can get ones that, uh, that become stray and they start uh, creating extra heat and extra losses. So we don't like those in there. So we have laminated armatures and laminated poles that gives you more heat transfer capability to get heat, heat out of the motor because heat is really the enemy. <laughs> Insulation degrades by time and temperature. Um, and you've probably heard of different classes of insulation. There's class B, there's class F, there's class H. Well, each one has a rating, and that rating depends on the insulating materials you have in it to provide a suitable life for that insulation system. Uh, class B is limited to about uh, 105 uh, degrees. Uh, class F is, goes to about 130 degrees. So you have better insulation, which means you can basically run the motor harder, get more rating out of it because it's insulated better uh, before the insulation system you know, wears out. There's different types of windings uh, also. We, the typical shunt one is the one we've talked about. If you add a, uh, a series winding on top of that, which is in series with the armature, you can now add flux or take away flux depending on the application to play with that overall flux. So that motor will have a different speed characteristic than uh, the normal shunt motor. Uh, when you have motors that are load sharing, like two motors connected together, you don't want to have a typical shunt kind of 
curve because you could have one motor that goes into a heavy load, one motor that goes into a lighter load. So we will add a, a compound winding, which is at series turns on top of that. There are also straight series motors, which are good for producing very large amount of torque uh, at low speed. And they don't really have a typical main field winding. They have the series turns are wound on there and connected in series with the armature. So as soon as there's a heavy load, you have a lot of flux, so you get a lot of torque. And as the load goes down, you have less flux so that the machine speed can go faster. And that's typically how locomotive uh, motors were in the old days. They were uh, series wound motors. Uh, ships, we built a lot of uh, DC motors for ships that were series wound because uh, the propeller is always in the water, so you always have a load on it. But at high load, you're going to get a lot of torque. Uh, that's needed to get the propeller moving and then as you go up in speed uh, you can uh, uh, the speed will go up and the load will go down here's our little curve of uh, horsepower constant horsepower and constant torque the constant horsepower range of a dc motor is between zero speed and base speed that you see on the nameplate so you get constant horsepower out of that and that's and that those motors used in that application is where the load varies in speed. And those are typically uh, uh, winders and uh, uh, drums and those kind of things. Constant torque is where the load is constant with speed. So you typically run those motors from zero up to base speed and then you lose torque because you have to weaken the field. So you run the motor more in the constant torque range. Hope we're okay so far. Um, when people buy motors, okay, my motor's gonna be at 5,000 feet, is that okay? Well, here's the one page application manual which tells you all of that kind of stuff. We design motors to be run in zero to 40 degrees C. Now you can get a motor that runs at minus 40 degrees C or 60 degrees C, but we have to do different things to it. We probably use different grease, we use different brushes, we would have to derate the motor or, uh, or other things. Same thing with humidity. Uh, humidity affects more of the brushes, and there are different brush treatments that we would use for different humidity characteristics. Uh, again, with altitude, we'd have to derate the motor uh, if it's on a ski lift at, at 10,000 feet, um, less, you know, more than a motor that would be run at, uh, at sea level. And there's some things on loading here. What a motor can take uh, starting is typically 250%. On the smaller ones, 300% full load current on the larger ones. You don't want to let it be stalled for too long because you can actually raise the copper in the uh, commutator bars and uh, that would lead to a lot of sparking due to the bars being all rough and the runout being rough. Yeah. Main so field. Is, so. that's, that's a very helpful page, Walt, though, because it does give people some uh, benchmarks to know whether they have a, you know, an issue with their motor or not an issue, depending on you well, know their field data and so forth. Yeah, so the first one on the speed variation, you know, it's not like an AC motor where you plug it, it's gonna run 1800 RPM all day long. Motors typically will run a little faster at, at uh, when they're cold and then they'll warm up and come into this range. So that's why we say right in here, uh, not to exceed 15% full load cold to full load hot on a ventilated motor. And that's important because people do, you know, we live in kind of a digital world, so they think it's gonna run exactly that speed and there is variations, and those are typically taken up by, because we have precise tachometers nowadays, and the drives are mostly digital that can be adjusted. But in the old days, you know, motors uh, pretty much ran off of motor generator sets uh, and pretty non-sophisticated SCR drives. So the motor, you know, you could uh, play a little bit with a motor, but you have to realize that you're not gonna get the exact speed on the nameplate. So that's a good slide to uh, keep track. This is another one. There's a lot of information here and I'll go over this for a minute. Let's go line by line. This is a 250 horsepower motor. It's rated 1150 to 1700 RPM, 500 volts. 398 is a full load armature amp, so it's a shunt wound. And this motor has four field leads that come out that you can hook in one circuit or two circuit. So you can either hook it for 240 volts on the field or 120 volts on the field. The nameplate amps are for the single circuit, 240 volt connection, 
So if you want this motor to run 1150 RPM when you start it up, you're going to put about 8.2 field amps on it and you run it zero to 500 volts, it goes up to about 1150 RPM. Then as you decrease the field down to 4.75, the motor speed goes up to 1700 RPM. I hope that makes sense to everybody. Because um, it is confusing. Some people think that, okay, one's a 240 volt connection and one's 120. The data is always for the single circuit higher voltage connection. And the field ohms are listed for the, the one circuit or the higher voltage connection. This one's insulation class F. It's continuously rated, so you can run it at 250 horsepower, 1150 RPM all day long. And the max ambient is 40 degrees C. The power supply code is C, which is, uh, I think, six controlled rectifiers and a freewheeling one, which is a pretty you know, smooth DC power coming in. There are different power supply codes for different applications and uh, costs and designs of motors. So that needs to be uh, watched carefully by the customer where it's putting the motor in. Uh, the field volts were mentioned. The separate ventilation is the air requirement for this motor. It requires 590 CFM at 0.65 inches pressure drop of water. So that's the amount of pressure through the motor. So you have to maintain 590 CFM to be able to run this motor down to basically almost zero speed uh, and have it uh, survive. The type there is the frame size. The enclosure is a drip proof, fully guarded, separately ventilated. The instruction book is listed there, which is uh, pretty important. The model number, and the serial number are the two probably most important pieces of data to get any information uh, for parts uh, and for test data and for anything else. The model number tells you every single nut and bolt basically in that motor when it left the factory. The serial number is a month, year, date code. Uh, so ND, uh, I'm not sure what month that is, but uh, D is the year. And then dash one tells you where it was made. And the 120 is the number of unit that month. And then, and then the uh, letters after it is the month and year when it was shipped. So this motor was made in the month of N and shipped in the month of P in the year of D. So I hope all that makes sense. There's a lot of different enclosures for motors. And then we got into the IEC things and I could never keep them straight. So I'm glad we had this chart. So if somebody said, I want an IP23 motor, well, now you can look over here and say, oh, okay, it's a splash proof, fully guarded, self-ventilated motor, which means that it's got uh, louvers on the covers. And I believe that they keep water out from 15 degrees from the horizontal. Drip proof covers keep water out from 15 degrees from the vertical. So a splash proof is a little more aggressive uh, cover. Uh, as we get into some of these IP54s, those are now totally enclosed and they have different ventilation schemes here. There could be air over frame or air to air cooled or water to air cooled. So now you have a chart of all the different NEMA enclosures versus IECs. Connection diagrams go out with every motor we sell. So for example, on a, on a typical DC motor, if you sell one with the leads out the right-hand side and a customer gets it and says, oh boy, I screwed up. I need the leads out the left-hand side. Well, you don't want to just take the leads and run them around to the other side because the leads can come out either side of our motors. We, we designed them that way on purpose. So we standardized on frames and, and everything else inside. Because remember that one slide where we talked about the laws, if you run a cable and it generates flux around it. So if you ran a cable all the way around, if you looked at all these armature cables and the A1 lead could basically be looked at that, okay, it goes from here to here to here to here and it makes a turn around the shaft. And if you have enough amps going through that, you're generating flux. That flux is going through the shaft. It will actually fail the bearings in that motor if it's a large enough motor, probably four or 500 horsepower and up. So what we've done on these connection diagrams is each one of these cables is labeled with a little balloon. You'll see a one and a two and three, four and all that stuff for the armature cables. Field cables have the same thing. This is for leads out the right-hand side on the top drawing. You look down here on the left side to put the leads out the left side, 
all those balloons are there. They're, they're the same cables, they're just rearranged. And if you turn it upside down in a mirror image, you'll see that like number six here on the uh, top one is number six here over here on the right hand side one up here. It's the same cable, it's just rearranged inside of there. So with the connection diagram, you can tell a customer or give a customer uh, the choice of moving the leads from one side to the other just by rearranging all the cables inside the frame. And there's other notes over here on the side on how to connect it for what rotation. And so connection diagram is very uh, beneficial. Let's go through some of the components. When we make main field coils, we start out by winding uh, enamel coated wire around a mandrel and we wind it wet so it's got glue on it. We cure it either by baking it or exciting the coil to produce heat. And then we tape it with a, uh, it's a glass leno weave, open weave tape, kind of pretty much what they use almost on hockey sticks, but a little more sophisticated. We dip it in epoxy, it's a sterling epoxy. And when it cures, it's hard as a rock. You can hit that coil with a hammer and you're not gonna hurt it. You can drop it on the floor. Uh, the disadvantage is if there's a short in it, you can't fix it. You can't do anything to it. The coil on the right has an additional compound or series winding. You see the big terminals here that are used in certain applications like excavator generators and some special uh, load sharing uh, motors. But it's built the same way. There's a Trek coil write up that describes the benefits of the Trek coil system. Commutating coils are made by taking heavy copper because they're running armature current through it. And we have an edgewise bender that will bend them into the shape that we need. We spread them apart, we dip them into resin, and then we dip them in the glass beads because there's very low volts between the turns on a commutating coil. And then we put them back together, we tape them up and we dip them in epoxy so they're hard as a rock and then they're ready to go. Commutators, we use three different kinds. Basically, on the larger motors, we use a glass banded one where all these segments that are separated by mica all the way around, each one of those segments connects to a riser and then the armature conductors are TIG welded in the ends here. We machine these grooves and we band them with high tension glass tape and then we coat them to protect them. And that holds that commutator together. We feel it's a pretty superior design because uh, it will grow evenly throughout its length as the machine goes up and down in speed. Molded commutators are typically used on the smaller motors. They have what's called a closed riser. It's a one piece bar. We're on the glass banded ones. This is all open in here and airflow is allowed to go through here to help cool the armature. Smaller ones, we don't need that cooling. Um, there's a little more, uh, more totally enclosed machines. So those copper bars have a special design on them that allow epoxy to be pumped in to hold them all together and to basically uh, seal the whole thing. Older style motors and the original motors all had V-ring or cap and cone commutators. Some customers even prefer those nowadays where there's a V machined into each end of the copper segment. They're all clamped together and a lot of pressure is applied to hold them around. And there's a mica cone that goes in each end and then the steel clamp ring. And on this one, you can see it's held together with four, four studs that go down through that are torqued to uh, basically clamp the thing together. So you'll hear V-ring, cap and cone or clamp ring. I got some other information in here on uh, storage. Customers will ask about, well, how do I store a motor? Well, again, it's good to keep it in a clean, dry area. You don't want a lot of temperature or dust. Uh, space heaters, if you have a lot of moisture, and that keeps some warm air in the machine so you don't get condensation and get rust or corrosion or uh, just uh, tracking. Uh, insulation resistance test is a way to check to see how wet or dirty a winding is, and it's called a mega test, and it's done by putting 500 volts uh, on the armature circuit or on the field circuit, and then you, you get the value. Uh, we, we recommend that you remove the brushes or lift them up. Uh, machines shipped from the factory have the brushes lifted with mylar on there to prevent corrosion, and it prevents any kind of uh, dark spots or flat spots developing on the comps. Slushing the shaft and bare machine parts keeps them from rusting. Rotate them every few months just to uh, keep the bearings lubricated and keep them moving around, keep all covers in place. And I always recommend to the customers, right the weight and the motor application on the frame 
because motors usually fail on a holiday or a weekend night and you got to change them out nobody knows how heavy they are and so they're scrambling so if you have that information on there you're a lot further ahead and our new name plates i think do list that uh, for the motors here's just a little bit on coupling up um, you know, when we ship out a motor, we usually don't put the couplings on it, so we're nice guys, and we give you a full-length key. Well, when we balanced that armature, we balanced it with a half key um, because we don't know how long your coupling is. So that's the way it was balanced. So if you put that full key in there with a very short coupling, you can end up with some vibration problems on a new motor ready to go out of the box. So you have to be aware, they have to be aware of how long the key is relative to the length of the coupling. And there's a little formula here just to uh, make sure the key extends more than halfway of the unused part of the shaft so that the steel up here makes up for the steel that you've cut off down here and you don't have an unbalanced problem. We recommend do not use any silicone around motors. Silicone's great in bathtubs and showers and stuff to seal things. But when silicone is put on covers or around the motor, it gives off vapor. That vapor makes brushes wear very fast. It turns to silicate, which is basically uh, the sand on the beach. Some of the maintenance items, uh, it's good to tell customers or the note, you know, look for unusual noises. Uh, if you have separately ventilated motors, make sure the blower motor amps and the filters are clean. As the filter gets clogged up on a uh, blower ventilated motor, it draws less current, the blower motor does, and it also puts less air through the motor. So that's not a good thing. Some customers will wrap filters and filters around things thinking that they're just filtering out dust, but what they're doing is creating less airflow um, and creating a hotter motor. The air in versus the air out should be a less than a 25C difference. So that's always good to know. We have little stickers on our blowers that show you which way the impeller should be rotating to make sure you got the airflow right because on, a, on an AC motor, you know, if you reverse uh, any two of the three leads, the motor will run the other way. So you have to be careful on which way you connect it up. And it's, whoops, and it's always good to look at a motor or listen to a motor with a stethoscope. Um, people do vibration signatures, which is also a good thing to do. Greasing. Uh, we recommend you remove the drain plug, clean the hole out, pump a new grease till it comes out the drain hole, let it sit for a while, let it purge itself out, and then put the drain plug back in and wipe any excess grease off uh, anything. When you pump grease into our motors, on the smaller motors, and on all of them, there's basically a grease cavity that you're pumping the grease into. Then there's a narrow annulus that we allow the oil to bleed out of the grease as the motor warms up, to actually lubricate the, the bearings. So we try to keep people and, and it eliminates less of the chance of over pumping the bearing to fail it because you can over you can put too much grease in there and actually fail a bearing from the friction and the heat that too much grease causes. So we try to keep a lot of that away from it and just let the oil lubricate the bearing. On the MD motors, the, the uh, roller bearing motors, it's more accessible, but a roller bearing can push grease out of the way because there's a lot more surface area on those rollers than there is on the balls. Uh, so we do allow the, bear, the bearing grease to go right in and basically kind of go at where the bearings are. And then of course the plugs on the bottom. The CD6000s have a, a pie plate that's in there with four little 1 8 inch diameter holes that allow the grease to come in sit in a grease cavity and bleed through those holes to actually lubricate the bearing. So that's how we try to keep it, to keep it away on those machines. Uh, shaft voltage, uh, we could talk just a second about it, but uh, shaft voltage is created when you have typically many drives uh, running many motors, like in a paper mill, where you don't have isolation transformers to limit or reduce the amount of harmonics that are generated. Every time an SCR fires, it produces a little harmonic. Well, when those harmonics add up, they can actually generate a voltage that comes basically out of the armature conductors and goes into the core steel due to the harmonics, and it looks for ground to go back to the drive. So it usually goes through bearings. Well, when it goes through the bearings, it causes pitting, and pitting's not good. So it's not a fault of the motor, 
but it's a fault of the whole sophistication of the drives, uh, lack of isolation transformers, and harmonics in the power system. So you can measure it using an oscilloscope, um, and if there's problems or if there's failures, you can readily see it in the bearing, but we recommend on the opposite drive end uh, to insulate the bearing and on the drive end to use a uh, ground brush. Here's a shot of uh, brush springs that are pushing down on the brushes. Brushes have a pigtail that comes out that actually gets the current into the brush. The pigtail is embedded down in there and there's a little brass tab on here. And when that brass tab is even with the brush holder as the brush wears, it's time to change the brush. Because if you don't, one of two things will happen is one is the brush loses, the spring loses tension as it coil uncoils down in, the brush will wear a lot faster. And if that wire, that pigtail that's in the brush hits the commutator, you're going to have a flashover and a nice ring of fire around there. But the other thing to notice on here is uh, these brush springs have a number stamped on it. And that indicates the, uh, the part number and also the spring tension. Uh, it's 436B465483A 4, a part one is a five and a half pound spring. That's the force the spring is pushing down at. Notice over here, it's an 82A. No, that's not good. That's only like a four pound spring. So that's not pushing as hard as this brush. So this brush is going to probably take more current because it's making better contact. So in a given motor, you need to have all the same part number springs, uh, maybe right or wrong. Because if you push too hard on a brush, you're going to wear it out mechanically. If you don't push hard enough, you're going to wear it out electrically from sparking by not making good contact. Here's some indicators if uh, customers or service shops want to know how much runout a commutator can tolerate because if it gets rough, uh, it's going to make the brushes wear faster, it's going to make them bounce, it's going to start sparking and other bad things. A chart that's in our instruction books is this check chart, things that uh, customers can do to look at their commutators and it gives them indications on the bottom here of what the causes of poor commutator condition could be. A uh, very good chart. Uh, for them to have. And again, commutators, the one on the left, you know, brand new out of the box, looks very good. The one in the center there, man, it was in a paper mill. A uh, lot of contamination, a lot of bad stuff, corrodes the copper. That can lead to uh, early failures and a lot of sparking. The one on the right, they pulled a couple of brushes out on the end here, uh, which isn't a good idea. If a customer is going to pull brushes out, what they should do is stagger they should probably leave a couple brushes in here, leave the next two out and put the, the last two in on the end and then do that alternate it on stud pairs. You do it every couple of studs so that you keep the whole commutator covered so that you don't end up with this kind of a, a looking commutator. A little bit on brushes and uh, cedar stone. It's good to seed in the brushes and places like Martindale and Ideal make cedar stone. Um, air cure it you blow it out and again no silicone around motors if customers have commutators that look like this uh, we recommend they probably do a corrosion study and there's things called air sampling coupons which is a strip of copper that you put in the airstream for one to three months you take it out you get it measured there's different places that do it and uh, the rule of thumb for dc motors is 0.5 microns per year of corrosion is kind of the, the, the rule of thumb. Uh, they actually do this for switch gear at drive uh, installation where they say 0.1. So if the, there's high corrosion, you get over 0.5 microns per year corrosion. That means yeah, your motor's gonna have problems and it's gonna fail sooner than it should. Things like having a blower down in a basement that's in a paper mill that's got all kinds of hydrogen uh, sulfide, sulfur dioxide, chlorine gets sucked up into it, probably not a good thing. A uh, little bit on troubleshooting and testing. Um, check the temperature of the motor, vibration, field amps, field volts. That's pretty much self-explanatory. Uh, we see problems with loose motor feet. Customer doesn't have the motor shimmed down tight. So there's some guidelines there. Coupling and keyway we talked about. Uh, vibration, this is another uh, two-day class. So I won't go too much into that uh, other than, uh, you know, if you can measure the displacement, that really tells you how bad the vibration is. If somebody says it's one mil, well, that's pretty good. If it's 10 mils, uh, that's not so good. The frequency really tells you the cause. 
And then there's, uh, you can measure velocity, which is the speed and how fast the motor's moving back and forth. But the displacement and the frequency really are the two key things. Insulation testing, there's some uh, information on mega testing. Uh, dielectric strength is basically high potting. Um, when we build a motor in the factory, all the windings are AC high potted, which is a pass-fail test. You don't want to put any bad windings into a motor. Out in the field, do you want customers to start high potting uh, at a very high voltage? Eh, probably not, because uh, you know service shops will high pot a motor. Oh, look at it failed. We saved you a downtime. Well, they might have failed it too. So uh, AC high pot is is not is kind of a destructive test. DC high pot is a non-destructive. It tells you how dirty or how much moisture is in a windings and if you need more work on them before you put it back into service. Commutation sparking problems. I'm, uh, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to uh, go into all that, but you, know, you can read through that when you get a chance. Uh, again, there's more information on it. And feel free to give any of this information to anybody you think uh, can use it. Of course, model number and serial number is good to know. When a customer pulls a motor out, it's always good to know, well, what do they think failed? You know, why'd the motor fail? Don't just send it out to the shop and say, fix it, because you may get a lot more, you know, it's like taking your car into the shop. You're not really sure what you're going to get. So have a good, good idea before it goes into the shop. Then it's always good to have the instruction books for weights and for connection diagrams and information. And again, if it goes into a shop, you want an incoming test, uh, you want to see if it makes sense to rewind it or just replace the motor. Um, repair what failed and not everything. And then, of course, test run it. You want a final report and ship it back for installation or storage, whatever makes sense. So we're up to questions. Okay, well, we have one, it's a longer question. So Okay. Read through it. Is there such thing as too much cooling air through a DC motor? I have a customer with a CD 4000 frame motors who keeps burning them up, usually roasting the fields out followed by armature failure. I keep telling them they don't have enough cooling air. Motor field is spot on. Motor okay. I can, I can answer that one by going through a little iteration. Okay, uh, perfect. <laughs> we know the field current is what gives us the torque. That's what we need to run the motor. The volts basically is a result of the resistance of the field times the current. So, and what we do on the motors is we rate it for, if it's a class F motor, we rate it for a 1.39 increase in resistance or in field volts. And if that's a 300 volt motor um, and the motor's running, you know, typically it should be about 300 volts on a field with the right field current at full field to give you the, the torque you need to make the motor run. If that field is running hotter and it starts going up to 330, 340 volts, that means the resistance is going up, the machine's running hotter, and there's more watts of heat in that motor. Um, we were on an application on a paper mill where they had a, a three-phase field exciter that had a voltage capable of about 500 volts. Well, there's nothing to limit the voltage, so it's just going to creep up and creep up and creep up. So what happens is if you start out and the motor's running cold, the field voltage may be only uh, 260 volts. As the motor warms up, it'll go up to the 300 rated that it's supposed to be, but if that field regulator has no limit on it, that voltage can raise up. Okay, the field gets a little warmer. What happens when it gets a little warmer? The field volts go up. Okay, that produces more heat in the fields because it's volts and amps is watts of heat or I squared R. So then the volts go up, the heat goes up, the volts go up, the heats go up. And after about a few weeks to maybe a month, that volts might be up out of sight. And what it's doing is pumping heat into those fields, which causes them to fail. Um, the Trek system that we develop for the motor fields is we have uh, their precision wound fields, so we get the most heat out of them, 
as opposed to some service shops that'll just wind uh, their own fields and say, well, these are these should be okay. We got the right wire and we're gonna schlock them over with some kind of epoxy and they'll be okay. So the thing that they wanna measure in that particular instant is the field volts and they wanna monitor that. And if they start creeping up way past 300 uh, or whatever the max field voltage is, then they know they got a problem with the field exciter. And a lot of times we found what we could fix in this paper mill was we limited the, the volts coming out of the exciter to be around 310 or 320. And they could do that by changing a tap on the field exciter in a lot of cases or the input voltage to the field exciter so that it doesn't have the capability of raising the voltage, which increases the heat, which causes the fields to burn out. And you can keep increasing the, the uh, airflow, but that's not going to always do it. <laughs> you just can't get enough air through there. Okay, perfect. Thank sense? you, Walt. Yes. Okay. So the second question is, Walt, thanks for the explanation. Could you explain 50% equalization versus 100% equalization on MD machines and what the real advantage that it gives us? Well, when you equalize, what you're doing is you're connecting parts in the armature that should be connected, that should be at the same voltage. So let's say uh, on a 50% equalization, uh, it, I don't want to get into a real technical explanation, but there might be four uh, coils in, a, in an armature slot. So what we're doing is on a 50%, we're connecting one of those to the other conductor that's going to be, depending on a four pole or six pole, 180 degrees or uh, uh, 90 degrees away at the same potential. We get a little better commutation with that. And then if we go to 100% equalization, that means we're connecting every conductor to every conductor that should be at the same voltage. We're connecting those together. So we're even making it a little better because we're connecting more points in the armature that should be at the same voltage together. And that's going to cause a little better commutation. And we've done that on the later machines. Um, we were just uh, forced to because of a lot of them going from DC motor generator sets on, on excavators, for example, to drives. And to get the motor to commutate with all the harmonics on the drives, we had to tweak whatever we could inside the motor and what we ended up doing was putting more equalizers in and more equalization to make that happen and that just makes everything smoother inside the motor okay good um I don't know if Rachel, were there uh, more questions? Yes, there is a question. Um, it is, can DC motors be re-rated in service shops by installing different field windings or different armatures? Okay. Um, when we design motors, they're basically designed in steps. Every rating isn't a custom rating. We do them in, uh, it's almost like 25% torque steps. But a rating has some variation in it so that uh, when you buy a motor, you're basically paying for a rating. That particular rating may be able to get more horsepower out of it or torque um, by adjusting even sometimes just the rating of the motor by looking at the design. Uh, it's hard to just re-rate a motor unless you're going to go from like a class B to a class F. So if you're taking an old motor that was a class B, and you put class F or class H insulation into it, you can re-rate it at a higher uh, capacity. Um, I'm not gonna, uh, uh, Flanders basically does that on the excavator stuff. They took the GE design and they installed class H insulation in it. And uh, they claim that they can get higher ratings out of them. Uh, and, they, and they pursued that. I mean, that's, the, you know, that's one of the things you can do is you put a better class of insulation, you can run the motor hotter, and you can get more out of it. Okay, perfect. It looks like we have one final que question. Are there different types of carbon brushes grades that work better in different industry environments, such as paper mills, transit applications, et cetera? 
Yes, there are. Uh, a brush isn't just a piece of carbon that gets stuffed in there with a wire in it and gets held down with a spring. Um, we spent years and years in testing and testing because of different environments. Um, for example, you know, regular uh, industrial brush, the T500, we went through a whole bunch of different grades for paper mills. Uh, paper mills, because of the different contaminants and the different loading, you may have to go to a different treatment which allows for better sliding contact, longer life. So there's a bunch of different grades for paper mills. There's grades for like ski lift applications because at high elevation, you don't have the lubricant, uh, enough lubricant in the brush to help it at that low humidity. So you need to help it along. So we put different treatments and there's a, a ski lift brush. There's an extruder brush because of the atmosphere and extruders and the loading. So you have to be careful. Uh, there are different brush grades, and of course, uh, different brush manufacturers tout different grades for different applications. But it's always good to uh, to know what they are and to standardize them, and they all have different charts and tables for those. Perfect. Thank you, Walt. I think that was the last question. If anybody has any additional questions, feel free to reach out to our sales team, and they can direct you to the right person at sales at PSCparts.com. In addition to that, this webinar will be recorded and it will be on our site with as well as the Q&A awesome. that we had for the last about 10 minutes of the webinar. So if you would like to share it, we will be sending an email out at the end of the webinar with the recorded version as well as the Q&A section. Great. All right. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you, Walt. I appreciate it. And, okay, uh, you're welcome. Yeah, you learn something. Even though I was at it for 28 years, I learned, <laughs> I learned something new every time uh, information is prevented, presented in the details and so forth. So uh, thank you very much. Okay, Fred. Yeah. Thank you everyone for joining and we hope to see you in our, our next webinar, which we will send in the follow-up email. Thank you. Okay. All right.